Hello. Hope everybody's doing well today. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. We're about five minutes out. Um, hopefully, you're all having a really good day. Look forward to talking about continuous integration and Jenkins today. So, um, folks are just getting on the line here. This is one of our most highly attended webinars so far. So, uh, keep that in mind as we're going along. Looking forward to talking about continuous integration in just a couple minutes. Thanks for being here. For those of you who are here a little bit early, if you can see my screen, let me know. Um, go to the questions section or the chat session. Say yes, I can see your screen, um, or no, I can't. That would be very helpful. I always like to check in before we get going on these things to make sure all the technology is working. Yes, I can. Thank you, Joy. It's nice to talk to you. It's been a while. Thank you very much. Should see dashboard. Perfect. Thanks, John. And I'm going to pull up. You should also be able to see me as well. Hopefully, you can see me. Uh, so I'm going to delete all these answers. Thank you. I can see it as well. Can you see me? Say, so, yes, I can see you. That would be great. Let's see. Yep. I got a yep from Joyce. I think we're probably pretty good. We'll get going here in just a couple minutes, those of you who are just joining us. Thank you so much for the feedback here, everybody. You should still be able to see my screen and see the uh, slides here. So if you cannot see slides, let me know. If you're just joining us, we got a couple minutes before the official start time, and I want to make sure to give everybody plenty of time coming back on the East Coast from lunch. And those folks on the West Coast just getting in this morning, and the people over in the UK just getting home. Or just getting done with tea time or whatever they do over there. This is great. We had lots of people sign up today, so I hope everybody can get in. We've got a, a max of 101 folks that can join in our registration this week. This month was 150, I believe, which is our best ever. So um, I'm going to have to. Now, some of you are saying I'm muted. Every once in a while this happens. I hope that you can all still hear me. Um, I noticed a couple of you say I lost my audio. My apologies if that happens. Looks like maybe we're good now. Sometimes the internet plays tricks on us, so uh, we'll just kind of go along with that. So before we get started, uh, just make a note to yourself that there are a bunch of people on this call. Uh, some folks, it's not just the 43 attendees right now, and I would expect closer to 75 as we get going here. But it's not just you and your folks around you. Some folks are bringing their entire teams and sitting in a uh, sitting in a conference room somewhere. So when you're asking questions, please be aware of that. You're asking them in front of 75 to 100 folks. Um, I love questions. I love all that. Today, I'm going to try to save a lot of questions until the end because this presentation, this demo is a little bit harder to get through talking and doing the actions all at the same time. So welcome. My name is Paul Merrill. I'm from Beaufort Fairmont Automated Testing Services and I'm happy to be here today. Um, we're in Raleigh and Cary, North Carolina and it is a rainy, dark, dreary day here but hopefully we'll brighten it up a little bit with this demo. So today we're going to do a demo on continuous integration with Jenkins. And the reason this is important is because right now one of the big problems that we deal with at Beaufort Fairmont is the problem of syncing up dev and testing. 
and figuring out how to do testing better. Most companies today are figuring out that in order to compete in the marketplace, they have to get their digital products, their software out to market quicker. And we're doing that through things like continuous delivery, continuous deployments, continuous testing, and continuous integration is a major part of that. So I think a lot of companies get stuck on this. I think a lot of testers get stuck on this. Um, and so today I wanted to go through how to do it with Jenkins, which is one of the better known and bigger market share participants with regard to continuous integration. Um, and it's an open source tool, so it's free to use. We're actually gonna get in and create builds and all that with it. I'm looking forward to doing this with you. Once again, both for Fairmont is here for your automated testing needs. So if you need to sync up dev and testing in your agile environment, we're the folks to come to. I'm the person to come to about that. Um, automated testing in general. If you've got a bunch of regression tests that you are doing manually and you want to figure out how to automate those, give me a yell. My Twitter address here, D. Paul Merrill. I love tweets while this stuff is going on. So please feel free to like the tweet if you uh, see um, if you see uh, something that's interesting to you, if you hear something that's interesting to you, please make sure to do that. My my handle is down here. So with all uh, that said, let's get started. Mark your calendars for these events. We will have another webinar called What's a Unit Test? So I'll be talking about unit tests from a tester perspective and going through how to create a unit test, what it is, how it works, and that date will come out soon. If you're in this webinar, I will make sure to email you. I have your email address and I will contact you about that. There are a lot of other things going on, a lot of local meetups. I'm going to Charlotte for a more of a regional meetup sometime in the next couple months. Um, several local meetups. There's a local conference on the North Carolina Project Management Institute, I believe it is, that will be sometime before this August date you see here. I'll be down in Orlando for Agile 2017 and hope to see a bunch of you folks down there. And in October, I'll be at Star West and I may be at Star Canada as well speaking. There is going to be a recording after this, so I will make it available as soon as, uh, as, as is available. And I am recording this now, so if you ask a question verbally over the phone, if you raise your hand and want to ask a question, um, and I unmute you, you will be recorded for that. So a little bit of background, if you want to go back and kind of get the base level, what is continuous integration? We have a webinar for that. Go out to beaufortfairmont.com slash webinars. It is called Continuous Integration and How It Affects Testing. And we go through some of the very basics of it. Um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time with that today because I want to dive in and get into the actual demo here. But I am going to touch on a couple things very quickly. Number one, continuous integration has been around for a long time. Uh, at least 15 years, that was the, last time, the first time that I experienced continuous integration. These great tools like Jenkins and CircleCI and Bamboo and all these tools have been out in uh, more modern times, the last six to 10 years, and those tools have been very, very helpful in moving the world of software development and continuous testing forward. But what you should know, I guess, is that continuous integration is, was really started by software developers. And software developers, what they used to do was they would sit down and one developer would go off into their world and another developer would go off into their world. Maybe there were three or four of them. And they would work on their code for weeks or months at a time, sometimes even more than that. And when they got back together, they had to integrate that code. So developer A, developer B, developer C, they had to tie their code all together. And what usually happened is during that integration, the code would break and things wouldn't work anymore. The application wouldn't work. And of course, everyone who is depending on that code being done at a certain time threw up their hands and said, what in the world is going on here? It's gotta be a better way to do this. And what they found was that not only did the code not work, but no one could tell you how long it was gonna take before the code would work, before they could make the changes. And one of the biggest pieces of this was that that feedback of knowing that that integration didn't work happened so long after some of the code was actually written that it made it very difficult to go back and figure out what the problem was. Because see, developer A could have written something on day one that broke something that developer B would work on 40 days later. And the process of trying to sync that up in one's head and go back and learn what the code was doing and what that conflict might have been over a long period of time made that process very difficult, very error prone, and very challenging in general. So over time, what we found is that the more integrations we can do over a shorter period of time, the better it is for software developers. This means less bugs for us as testers. It means that developers will find bugs earlier in the process, which saves us all time and money and gets us to deployment quicker, hopefully. 
So today, when we're using continuous integration, software developers are getting the feedback from these continuous integration systems very quickly. In fact, they may get it in seconds after um, committing a piece of code to their source code repository. They may get it in minutes, seconds, they may get it in hours. Regardless, we're getting it a lot quicker than days and days and days after we started working on something. So that's kind of where that comes from. And the idea of integrating tests with this came probably very quickly after that, that if we could have something to verify that not only did the code build, and this, when I talk about building, I'm not just talking about compiled languages. There are things that we can do like static analysis and dynamic analysis on interpreted code as well. But, um, but very quickly on, we said, you know, if we could verify that that build actually works, that there is something in it that does what it's supposed to do, that would be great. And if we could automate that, it would be even better. So that's when continuous integration started to come along. If you want more information than that, go to bftft.com slash webinars, or the same way you got here, may, maybe the same way you got here, beaufortfairmont.com slash webinars. We've got all of our previous webinars out there in recorded version. Listen to this one, it'll give you the fundamentals of that. We're gonna go through several technologies today. You don't have to know all these. If you don't know any of them and, and you've never seen these words before, you're probably in the wrong place. Hopefully you've seen some of them. Uh, you don't need to know everything, but I am not going to be able to jump in and explain the intricacies of Maven goals or phases or life cycle or anything. I'm not gonna be able to go in and explain what a commit or an add and get is and how it differs from subversion. Uh, I won't be able to tell you the difference between Phantom Driver and Chrome Driver in Selenium or whatever else. What I will be able to do is get into Jenkins and continuous integration, so I'm looking forward to that. I'd like it if we could kind of hold off on questions until the end because this is kind of intensive on me trying to think through what's actually going on, what I want to say to you, and then do it at the same time. Uh, it's also a little nerve-wracking with so many of you folks looking at this, so uh, bear with me and we will get into some questions later on. I've got plenty of time for that. This presentation is about 30 minutes, 35 minutes, so we'll have plenty of time to get into questions at the end. So today we're gonna to get into the installation of Jenkins and I'm gonna kind of talk through that at a high level. I think it'd be kind of a waste of time to actually go through the install in this. If you need that, I'm more than happy to talk about it later. So give me a ring, uh, send me an email, paul at beauforfairmont.com, hit me up on Twitter, D. Paul Merrill, whatever it is, and we can talk through the installation of Jenkins, but I'm gonna give you a high level overview of what I dealt with in getting it set up. We're gonna go through creating builds for this app. So I've got a demo app that one of my folks created for me. It's an invoicing system and it has two pieces. It has a back end and a front end and those are considered two apps today. We're gonna run, write builds, create builds for both of those in Jenkins. And then finally, we're gonna create a build for our test. And the test today is running on Selenium. It is using Phantom Driver, which is a headless driver, meaning we don't have a browser that pops up. Uh, many times when we're doing continuous integration, we like to use headless browsers because no one's watching the screen while we're doing this. So Headless browser can be very helpful for a lot of different reasons. Um, once again, if you're just joining in here, we're, we're getting started. I'm kind of giving an overview. We've got about 73, 74 people on the call here. So if you're asking questions, just know that there is contention for asking questions. So I'm gonna save questions until later and understand that you're speaking in front of not just those folks, but some people are in a room with more people. So you're asking in front of a bunch of folks. So the overview of installing Jenkins, it just took 20 minutes. Um, a little bit about what I did was I've got a Linux box. It's actually bare metal and it's bare metal for a reason. I like to, to have it here. I've got plenty of reasons for it. Um, in this case, it's running Ubuntu and I went out and got Jenkins and installed it in just 20 minutes, which was great. And the most of that 20 minutes was reading about how to install it and then watching it install things with apt-get. Uh, well, that's that's 20 minutes plus three hours of configuration. So in my case, I actually had multiple web servers running. And in order to get everything working together and realizing that one was running Tomcat, and one was on Nginx and everything else, I had to mess around with things and learn a lot more about web servers and how they run than I wanted to. So it was just 20 minutes plus three hours of configuration. Uh, well, and then I had I had a bug. So uh, there was a, there was an upgrade to Jenkins while I was doing this, and of course, there, an upgrade comes along on your application, and you click the upgrade button, right? So that's what I did, not thinking that it could possibly be bad, and there was a bad upgrade, and that cost two more hours, and the majority of that two hours was me trying to figure out how to work through or resolve the problem rather than rolling back. The rolling back actually only took maybe ten minutes, and getting set up like that. This is not to say that Jenkins is a bad product. 
it's to say that any application that you install on your systems is going to take some time. I think this was probably actually fast compared to a lot of folks out there. Um, and it just depends on how your systems are set up and what configuration you need. The upgrade was something that I haven't experienced that problem. I haven't experienced that with Jenkins in the past. I think it was kind of a one-time deal. It's probably fixed by now with the latest versions. I imagine they fixed that particular issue pretty quickly. And it could be that if you installed it without doing an upgrade on the latest version, you may be able to kind of sidestep some of that. So with that said, Jenkins really wasn't that bad to set up. Uh, some of this was just my being stubborn and wanting to do it my own way, but everybody's going to have their own situations and their own configurations, so keep that in mind. With that, let's get on to the demo. So if you cannot see my screen, please let me know. You should be seeing a dashboard for Jenkins right now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take myself off of video so that you have hopefully more of your screen dedicated to this. I don't know how your resolutions are set up or what you're actually doing there. But hopefully you no longer see me and you can see the screen. If you have a problem with that or can't see it, drop a note in the chat or the question section for GoToWebinar. So this is Jenkins. Uh, well, actually, I'll log out and I'll show you. This is what it looks like. When you get installed, when you first get installed, you have a different message here. You won't have a login box. What you'll have is something that tells you how to get credentials on the system, how to create a user and password, those kinds of things. I've already gone through those steps, so I'm skipping them for you today. I'm going to log in, and I want to uh, I want to create new jobs. So, a little bit about Jenkins. It looks a little bit basic, and you know, it's not a single page application. Each thing you click is going to take you to a new page. Don't get bothered by the usability. Uh, instead of the power. So sometimes things that look basic can be incredibly powerful. And one of the things that we're going to see today is a very basic thing, which is using the command line and the command prompt in Linux and how powerful that is and how Jenkins allows us to use that power for our builds and running our tests. And just as a side note, if you're a tester and you don't have experience with the command line, either in Windows or Linux or both, that is probably one of the most important and most powerful places that you could focus attention. So go learn command lines, whether it's on Linux or or Windows. So Jenkins, this is Jenkins. We have this, um, you know, we've got notifications up here showing me who's logged in. On the left, we have these new items, people to manage, managing Jenkins. You can add a whole bunch of plugins to Jenkins. So it's kind of the way that this product works is it's got a level-based functionality. Because it's open source, they have made it so that it's very easy to create plugins. Lots of people have done that. Some of those are installed. I installed all the default ones when I installed this. Um, so there are quite a few plugins that are installed here. I'm going to use some of the base functionality just so that we can, uh, everybody can kind of be on an even playing field with this. But generally what you would do to set up a build is you go up here to either you click create new jobs or create new item, either one works and you pick a type of job. And for today, I'm gonna to use two different ones. I'm gonna use a freestyle project and then I'm gonna use the Maven project a little bit later. The applications that we're building, I mentioned. So we've got a back end, which is a Java project that runs in Maven. We've got a front end, which is basically a bunch of JavaScript for a single page application and some HTML. And then our tests are all in a Maven project as well. For the application part, back end and front end, we're going to use freestyle projects. And then for the test, we're going to use this Maven project. Don't worry about Maven if you haven't used it before. It's just a build tool for Java um, that helps you out with dependencies. So first, I'm going to start with the back end. And uh, well, you know what? Actually, I want to take a step back here. First of all, I want to look at the application. This is what we're aiming to deploy. This is what we want to see. It's a invoicing application. You can create an invoice. You see that John Doe is logged in here. These are some invoices that are already in the system. Uh, once again, this is running Angular on the front end, Java on the back end, Redis uh, behind that. So we had to set all of that up as well. This is the back end and what it looks like. So this is a RESTful API. And if you call this URL, you get back this JSON that looks like this. And you'll notice that this looks a whole lot like the data that we see in here all day plumbing. Hopefully all you guys are still with us here. Um, I may or may not be able to see hands if you raise them. And once again, if you could save questions to the end, that'd be terrific. So I'm not going to get a lot into the application. Just know that it's there and it's running. If I do a refresh, you can see it's still there. If I do a refresh over here, it's still here. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to 
make sure to kill off the uh, web the web server really quickly to give us a nice clean starting spot and you can see on the back end it's no longer there so I've killed off that process that was running in a web server there and I'm also going to um, so, so I've done all the steps there great what, what I want to do first is this back end so we started to create this so we've got an invoices back in the name of the application is invoices we're going to start with the back end a freestyle project which means any command line commands that you want to do are available we've got a project name here which is kind of like the name of our build um, a project kind of holds more than just a build all of this is available in github so this is my github repository you guys are welcome to go out and grab this and play with it if you want invoice backend is the name of it this is the url to it so i'm going to go over here and inside my jenkins project i'm creating a telling it that this is a github project and I do that by giving it the URL to my GitHub site. And by doing this, what I'm actually doing is saying, hey, Jenkins, I have a source code repository. And at certain times, I would like you to go out and grab the code from there and build it. So that's what I'm doing here. So I've set up this GitHub project with the URL. I've got Git in here, my source code management. There are lots of plugins and things, once again, that you can use here if you're on Mercurial or Team Foundation Server or whatever, uh, the latest great um, Circle CI, or not Circle CI, but the latest great source code management tool is out there. You can probably get a plugin for it. I've just got Git and Subversion set up here. Those are two of the more common ones as well. Now, we can tell Jenkins when to build this product. And one of the things that we want to do is kind of give it a baseline. So say, periodically, I want to build this. And you know, one of the great things about Jenkins is, is its documentation here. So you saw me click on the Help button here, and it gave me all of the configurations for how to set up a schedule for when to run periodically. I'm not going to read through all that. You can do that on your own time. But what I'd like to do is set up a configuration to run this once a day. And this is the way that I would do that. And when I put that in here and move off of that field, you can see it says well, you would run last on Monday at the you know 11, 15 a.m. And the next time would be Tuesday at 11, 15 uh, a.m. For whatever reason, the clock here is wrong from my clock. Uh, that's fun. But we also want to do not just building it periodically because running a build once a day is probably not enough to ensure that the code that we've checked in either works with the test cases that we have persisted in our test automation or not. We probably want to do it more often than that. So we can actually pull git and source code management is what this STM stands for. So I'm going to pull git every once in a while and I'm going to create a schedule much the same as the one up here. And this one I'm going to pull every 15 minutes. And this is the way that you would do this. Um, and once again, you've got the great help over here that would allow you to figure that out on your own. I'm going to make sure that every time I build something, so there's a workspace. Jenkins keeps a workspace when it pulls this code down out of GitHub. And it's going to build inside this workspace. It's going to pull all the code down in there and do some stuff with it. I'm going to make sure, I like to be clean. I like to make sure that everything's cleaned up before I get started with with building and with whatever else so I'm going to check this delete workspace button before build starts and make sure that every time I build I'm deleting out that workspace it's just a nice safe way to go but for this to actually do something I have to add build steps so I'm going to add build steps and the step that I'm going to add is of the type execute shell we talked a little bit about the command line another name for a command line in Linux is a shell I, I lied to you a little bit there but basically you could call it a shell they're kind of kind of synonyms not really um, and what we're gonna do here is we're gonna add in some steps so for thinking about what kind of steps we want to do well we want to start up a web server to run our application once the build is done right um, and so we're gonna add that in here and what I'm using is I've got a the, the, the employee who wrote this for me did a terrific job. One of the choices that he made was to use Spring Boot uh, for, for, for Maven, which is a plugin for Maven, in order to package up not just the application, but also a web server in it. And then you could just deploy it like that. And Spring Boot allows you to run that web application. So this command, uh, I'm, I'm using Maven MVN to run the application this way. 
in Jenkins, you want to echo out the command, and then you're, we're actually going to run it. So one of the um, there is one bug with Jenkins that I'm aware of with regard to long running processes. If you think about it, if you're going to run a web server, it's going to be out there running for a long time, right? And we don't necessarily want it attached to a parent process. We don't want Jenkins to have to just wait or um, or, or stall out waiting for it. Instead, what we want to do is we'd like to kick off that process another way and kind of free Jenkins from it. And one way to do that, one recommended way in Jenkins, as I was reading through this and getting, getting ready for this demo, is to use the at command in Linux. So I downloaded that through apt-get, and at allows you to kind of schedule something relative to now. Uh, they recommended not using now, but instead using plus one minute for the shortest interval after now. So basically, we're going to run through, we're going to grab all the source code, we're going to build it all, and then one minute after we do that, we're going to kick off our server, okay? So this is going to be the server that runs over here. Right now it's not there. It, hopefully it will be when this build works. There's a couple other steps I need to do here. So I'm going to create a couple other steps. One is that it's great that we're kicking off this server, but we need a way to know what we kicked off so that we can remember it for later. And the reason that we want to remember it later is when we run a subsequent build, we want to kill off the server that we started with the previous build and start a new one, right? So I was looking through how we do this. I believe that there are plenty of plugins to do this, but it's just the simplest thing that could possibly work was I was going to go out and save the process ID so that I could kill it off later. And I'm going to do that two minutes after the build so that we've had time for the application to actually start. And I can explain this to you very briefly. pgrep is a command in Linux to allow you to find a particular process in the process list. Spring Boot is the keyword that we're looking for in that list. Um, the dash F is allowing us to look for the keyword and we're going to output that and overwrite this file in the workspace that, and create it if it's not there called temp PID. We're going to write that process ID out to that file. So now I've saved off the process ID from this run of the application and I am going to kick that off two minutes after now. Any good tester on the call is saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, Paul, there's a problem here. You're assuming that one minute after the application kicks off that number one is going to be running and have a process ID. Number two, that no other builds are kicked off so that we're not overriding this temp ID. And you're absolutely right. I'm trying to go with the simplest thing that could possibly work right now. Those are all problems that you can solve at home. Uh, in your own time. But there's one other step here, and that is we want to make sure that we kill off any existing process that's already started, any existing application server or, or um, the one that ran with the previous build. And so I'm going to make a step here that's going to use the kill command in Linux. We're going to grab the process ID out of the file where we put it in this one, and we're going to use kill-9 to do that, okay? Um, and obviously, uh, this needs to go a little bit higher up here in the process. We want to kill off any existing ones prior to running the new one, right? So now we've got all this in the right order. And so if you've got questions, make a note right now about this. We're going to be done. Hopefully, we're done with this build, and we're going to run it and see it work, and then we're going to move on to the next one. So make a note that this is on the first build or that this is the back end. I'm going to apply this and save it, and we see in our dashboard on Jenkins that we've now got this one new job, this one new project called Invoices Backend. And if I go in here inside the project page, you're going to have slightly different options. You can configure the project, you can delete the project, and you can build now. It also gives you an option to see the workspace. Ours is not there yet because we haven't run it at least once. And there's a, another, um, several other things here. So I'm going to go ahead and build this and let's see, hopefully it works. Um, this is the thing with, with doing this in front of people is you get a little nervous when you run this stuff. The other thing you can see is the console output. So this is the output from the build. We just ran it, and this is our output from it. And you see at the end it says finished. You can also see a few other things in here. So if you look closely, you'll notice that after the checkout, we came in here and we did a kill on temp ID so that there was no process running at the time. So I tried to do a kill-9 on no process. And then we see this is where we actually ran the um, 
the application one minute later. Hopefully, it's been I've stalled enough, and hopefully, it's running now. Let's see, it's not quite yet. Um, and I'm gonna okay. Now it looks like it is. So let's see if it's up here. There we go. Okay, so that application is now running. The other thing is that we said that two minutes later we were going to save off that PID file. I'm not going to make us sit here and wait for two minutes, but we can come back later and make sure that that works. But that's our first build, okay? So we've all created the first build. Um, we also want to do the front end. So let's build out the front end really quickly. I'm going to do a new item. Hopefully this will be quickly. This is also going to be in freestyle mode. Um, I'm going to do the front end here. So freestyle project, you would have to type this in. I've, I practiced this presentation several times, which is why I have the drop downs populated here. But I'm going to do a freestyle project. It's much the same as before. We've got a GitHub project that we're going to link to. Hopefully you guys are starting to sense a pattern here, right? You're going to go grab code from, from somewhere. In our case, it's GitHub. We're going to, we have to tell Jenkins about that. Um, we're going to make sure that we specify Git in the source code management section. We're going to supply our credentials. This is something that you would have to do with so getting your credentials, you have to go over to GitHub and get your credentials and then come back and populate them here. This add button allows you to set up credentials. I've already done that step in going through this presentation a few times. Remember what we did on the last build, we're going to do the same thing with regard to how often we're going to run it. I'm going to run it at minimum once a day and then I'm going to pull the source code control management system every 15 minutes like this. So we're doing the front end here and there's really not much to the front end. There's no compilation that needs to happen. There's not much that needs to go on. Really all I need to do is after I get the code, I want to copy it to a place where my web server knows where it is. So that's really the only step that I need to do here. The reason why I want to do a copy from the Jenkins workspace is Jenkins could update this workspace that I, I have listed here. It could update that at any time. So I want to make sure that I'm not, um, I'm not trying to copy, I'm not trying to run a web server out of a workspace that could be changed at any time. I don't, I don't want those problems. I want to copy it once and update what the web server can go and get. So I'm copying it out to a location that works for me. So this is just a copy command. Uh, that's all that's going on here, and I also need, I missed one part of this here, the at one minute. Once again, this is one of those commands that I want to make sure it doesn't just hang. And so that's added. I'm going to apply and save, and we have a build now. Once again, if we go up to Jenkins, we can see at the dashboard, we can see the back end, we can see the front end. Here's the front end. I'm going to do a build now. We're going to do our first build. And by the way, when you're setting this up for your application, you're not going to get it all right the first time. I'll just go ahead and tell you that. Um, I've been practicing. <laughs> so um, I had a lot of mistakes to learn through to get this to all work, hopefully all work the first try in front of you, and hopefully give me enough experience that if it doesn't go right, I can fix it in front of you. So that is our first build right here. We can go in and look at the console output. And really, once again, here are all the git commands. It goes in and grabs, it does a checkout right here. Um, and we make sure to do the copy that we talked about here. So our back end was running before. I'm going to refresh it and show you it's still there. Our front end should still be working as well. Let's see, it's still there. It's still got the same data because it's connected to the same database. And that should be the updated code there. So that's two builds. That gives us the front end and the back end. We're going to get into the tests right now. So if you've been waiting patiently for the test, this is your time to tune in. If, on the other hand, you have questions about this second build, the front end, make a note of them and so that you can remind me of what your question is about when we're at the end of the presentation here. And I want to make sure to get to those questions in a couple minutes. So let's build another item. So a new item, this is going to be a project and it's going to be called um, invoices tests. This one is different. I'm going to do a Maven project this time. So I mentioned that we were using Maven to manage our dependencies in a Java project for the test.
test. It looks like some folks have lost audio here. Um, um, I'm still here. Let me know when you can hear me again. It sounds like it's back on for some folks. Good. Sounds like we're back. Great. I'm not sure what you missed, but some of you may have noticed that I've got a different project here than my application. And the reason that I did that is that's just kind of how it worked. It's just kind of how it worked for this project. Generally, what I would do is I would make sure to have my test cases in the very same place as my application. And I like to do that because that makes sure that the application and the tests are synced up. That's not always possible. Uh, and it doesn't make sense in every single project, but in general, I like to have a history that shows me um, th that if I go back to a certain point in time, I can run the application from that point in time, I can run the test from that point in time, and we can see where our expectations at that point in time correct. So that's the main reason that I, I like to do that. But in this case, I have not, so hopefully they're staying fairly well synced. Once again, we created our link over to the GitHub project. I'm adding in the GitHub repository here in the GitHub section, um, adding my credentials, and now we get to do the fun stuff. So, first off, we have a build that's in Maven this time. Oh wait, we need to set up some times, right? So build periodically, we're gonna do this very, the very same as everything else we've done so far. At minimum, run our tests. This build is about running tests. So at minimum, we're saying run our tests once, once a day. And also try to ping our test cases every 15 minutes and see if anything has changed. Uh, let's see. And then finally, what we're going to do is we need something to build. So in Maven, you have what's called a POM file, and that's a, I don't know, project something management file, POM, I don't know what that stands for. But basically it's saying these are our dependencies, this is the project, this is how stuff is built, and I'm setting up this goal uh, to run a few of these. I want to run just one of my test cases to start out. It's called Selfish Data Generation Strategy Test. If that looks familiar to you, it's because I used it in the data strategies presentations that I do, um, the demo one specifically, and I named the test for that. I knew that this was one of the tests that I could run repeatedly and have no problems with, so I wanted to start out with that. So that's our build step, and we have one more step with this, which is we want to make sure that whatever we do with these test cases, we report. And in order to report things in Jenkins, we're going to create a post step. So after the build is all done, after Maven is done running, we want to make sure we want to make sure that we can get um, the output of it. And for some reason, I'm not seeing the one that I want. Mm -hmm. This looks like maybe I did this wrong. Let me take a step back here. Once again, this is the hazard in Trying to do this in front of folks. Bill goals. Post actions. I'm looking for the J unit. I'm looking for the J unit reporting piece of this. So if anybody is on the call and they remember exactly where that is because they've done this before. Or if you guys see it, let me know. Um, maybe this is different. Maybe I do it this way. Let's try this. And let's see if now we get something here. Should we publish the report? Darn it. Well, I guess practicing three times wasn't enough. All right, so we're just going to see if this works, and I will have to come back later and figure out why we don't have that in there. Let's apply and save, and let's run this. And we ought to be able to see our test cases run. So what, what I was, uh, shoot. Oh, you know what? I think I remember what happened here. Let me see. Yeah, okay, all right, I know what the deal is. All right, let's go back. See, you get to, you got some extra work here. It's not all just scripted right in front of you. I got to fix all this. So 
new item, we're going to do this differently. Um, I made a mistake here. For this new item, we're going to do the same as all the others and do a freestyle project. And for this freestyle project, once again, the way that we had it set up was setting this as the repository and we were setting up get source code management. Here, just bear with me as I get caught up to where we want to be. I appreciate your patience. Triggers build periodically and we had this going once a day, which looks like this. And we had polling every 15 minutes, which looks like this. And you guys have all seen that four times now. So you're pros at this. We want to delete the workspace as we're getting going. Then we're going to have a build step. Uh, wait a minute, that's not right. We're going to have a build step to invoke Maven goals. And it looks like this. And then we're going to have a post build step. Aha, you could not get away from me. I found you. And this is basically JUnit. So I'm running everything in JUnit. And Maven gives us a plugin for running JUnit tests called Surefire. And you see that in the text here. And Surefire automatically generates reports in XML. And that XML format is one that's well known. And Jenkins knows that format. So this post build action here, which is what I was looking for when I did this before, is giving us the ability to show reports of our tests. And don't get confused by the fact that this is JUnit. Um, that's just the runner. It's actually running Selenium tests but it's going to generate XML test case, uh, reports here, and, uh, and this is where we keep them within our working directory. So I'm gonna apply this and save it, and we are gonna try once again to build this. Should see a little bit more success here. And I'm gonna click on this build and show you the console output as it's running. So some of you folks are familiar with Maven, and this looks very familiar. Um, but I see some good things here already. So number one in our output here, you can see we go out, we grab the source code from GitHub here, and then we start this Maven build. And it's uh, the way that they look, the, the builds, they generally have this ugly logging here with this info in front of it. But uh, this is what a Maven build looks like. And at the end here, it's running the test. And you see that it's running the one that we specified, the test case that we specified. And it's using Phantom JS. So one thing I mentioned was that I was going to use a headless browser. Phantom JS is a headless browser that's available to run with Selenium. And so that's what I'm calling into here. Um, we saw that, that ran, and basically down here we see the test run. This is this is nice. It tells us, hey, we had one test that run, ran, no failures, no errors, and none were skipped. And that's terrific, it means that we succeeded. But it's not that pretty to look at. So what I was trying to do was to make sure that we had something slightly prettier to look at. And so let's go back here to the build that we just ran. This is the build that we ran at 138. And in this one, something that's different is this test results. And once again, I'm gonna to try to speed up a little bit here because I know that there are gonna be questions. We're about 20 minutes left in the hour that we scheduled together. But these are the test results. So you get something that looks graphical and that was generated from the XML file that we told Jenkins to look at. And we see that one test passed in Jenkins by default, blue means good and red means bad. So blue means we passed. We can drill down into the packages. We can see that actual test case. It took 4.3 seconds. Uh, one pass, the difference between this and the last build was a factor of one. So we added one new test since the last build because we had none the one before because there was no build. And we see here that it passed. And you can actually drill down quite far in here and see some information. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I wanted to do here. We went through and we ran a test case. One thing you'll notice here is if I refresh this, it should have new data because the test case created new data in the system. So we should have one line more here. Let's just try this and see if it looks a little bit bigger. So you guys watch. And it, it does. It looks like we got another record down here. And I'm populating it with just random data. Uh, a lot of this is random Latin words and phrases. So that's, um, that's what that looks like. And then in the contract, in the actual face, uh, the, the front end, we ought to be able to see that new one as well right here. So this is the new one that we just created. So that's how to create builds in Jenkins. So we created the back end, we built the application, the back end of the application. 
we built the front end of the application, which are invoices back end, invoices front end. We made it so that they would deploy, and then we ran Selenium tests against it. And I'm more than happy to talk through any of those details as we go through them. Uh, this is a time when if you want to use the questions mechanism in GoToWebinar, type in there and I will get to them as, as they come through and I'll try to read them and answer them as we're going. I'll give you a little bit more information about this. So you see me doing this and building these three builds in 40, less than 41 minutes because I started with kind of a 11 minute preamble, but 30 minutes basically. Um, I'm also going to start the camera again here so that we can have a little bit more personal um, conversation. But, um, and I may not share, uh, I guess I will share my screen. Okay. Um, but uh, it, it took me quite a bit longer than just 30 minutes to do this the first time. It actually probably took me a total of 35 hours to get all this working. And that is coming from a position of lots of software development background, coming from not having installed Jenkins and run it very often lately. I'm including in that the five hours and 20 minutes of getting Jenkins set up. I ran into quite a number of problems along the way to getting this up and running. Um, but I would think that most folks within a couple of weeks could have this running. And the question then becomes, you know, is it worth it for your team? And personally, running automated tests as often as once a day, as often as every hour, whatever it is, um, as often as, as that is a good thing. And it's something that's worth one person sitting down for a week or two weeks and getting this running. And frankly, it wouldn't have taken so long if I had chosen to do it another way. So one decision that I made that caused me some significant headaches was running on my own bare metal. I think if I had set this up in AWS, for instance, if I created an Ubuntu instance there, and you don't have to run this on Ubuntu, you can run it on Windows, you can run it on um, on Mac, you can run it on whatever application you want to, whatever OS you want to run it on. But if I had run it on a cloud system, I wouldn't have had to worry about what was already running on the system. Instead, I could have dedicated that entire system to that. You can go out and get a Docker image, and you can run an image of Jenkins in Docker. Uh, so that's a much easier way to get the setup and running. Um, the application that I was running was probably a little more complex than I knew and I wasn't as familiar with the application as I would have liked to have been and potentially many of your folks are much more familiar with their applications than I was with this one. Running the test cases, it had been a while since I had set things up to run in this particular way. So you're going to have test automation engineers who set up Selenium stuff every single day and it's going to be easy for them to run some of those things. So it could be that my 35 hours of work could be something that your folks could do in much shorter time. It could be that it could take a lot longer time, but just know that I was, I work pretty quickly in general and that's how long it took me. So I just want to set some expectations here. So Steve asks, where does the Java actually compile? It looked like a part of, it looked like it was part of the Git download. That's a very good question, Steve. So let's go back to Jenkins, and what I'm going to tell you is where, for the test project, it gets built. Um, oh, that's not what I want. We can look in the logs here. Oh, where is this? Here we go. Tests. And we ran it once before. Here's where it is. We can go back to the logs and see. So in here, oh, well, it should have been running in Maven, I'm not seeing. No sources to compile. I must have done something wrong here with that. Steve, I'm not going to be able to answer your question on that. My apologies. But it should be getting run in here. Maybe I, I may have some goals out of order, and maybe that's why I'm not seeing what I would expect to see in here. It does say compiling 15 source files right here. I guess that's what's going on. Um, it's been a while since I looked at Maven. I've been working in uh, Node and uh, C Sharp for a while, so remembering all of this is different. But it's, I've got a resource file in there, so it's copying that here. It compiles the 15 source code files here. It's putting it into, um, this is our workspace, uh, and this is our, it used to be like a classes directory with Maven as a target directory, so it's putting those in there. And then it packages it up um, it may not package on this because I mean I have that phase set up, but that's where it's doing it. Um, 
So if we had seen it live, it would have shown us. Another question by Tom. I want to read it first before I just read it out loud. How do you tell Jenkins to report automated test results back to a test case management system, in my case, Zephyr? That's a good question. Um, I would imagine there are plugins for that. Uh, I've worked with Jira before with that, and there's a plugin for Jira, so basically um, it reports back into Jira on that. Um, you know, there, there are some other issues in that question that we could dive into very, I try to do it very briefly. But basically, you know, in the, the reason that a lot of people would want to record test results back into a test management system is generally because they need to audit the running of those test cases. Usually with continuous integration, you're going to be running so many test cases so frequently that you would just kind of be clobbering your test management system, test case management system in doing that. You'd be sending a gazillion records um, of all of the test cases that have been run, you know, every hour of the day or multiple times a day. And how useful is that to you? Usually what we're trying to do is we're trying to ensure that an audit works. So most people who want that type of functionality also have the consideration of regulatory um, constraints. And those regulatory constraints usually come from places like the FDA or some financial uh, SEC type thing. I don't know what it would be in other countries. But in the US, we usually have those particular organizations to work with. And just the, the, the other thing that I would suggest with that is that I find many times with my clients and when, when I'm working with highly regulated clients that we think that because we automate something, we need to be able to audit all of the test automation logs always. And that comes from this assumption that if we're going to do test automation, we need to make sure that it is auditable, which is fine. But does every execution of every set of test cases need to be automated? I don't know that that's the case. So sometimes what we can do is we can take that dependency and break it apart and say, maybe there are times when we execute test cases that we need to be able to audit and we will report those back to a test case management system. And maybe there are times when we run this and we don't want to be able to audit them. And in those cases, we don't need to report back to a test case management system. And by doing that, separating out that dependency, Many times what we can do is find better ways to run things more quickly and to achieve the goal of determining, does the application do what we think it will do? Does the application do what our test cases that we have persisted say it should do? Uh, so we're getting that piece of information. The auditing sometimes is helpful and sometimes it is not. Hopefully that answers your question there, Tom. Um, and then in the back end, so Steve wanted to know um, on the back end as well where that's getting built out. So let me uh, go back. And I'd be happy to answer this offline if we have other questions here, and I may need to do that, but let me see here. So where are we here is the build that we did. Here's the console output, and you see where we grab the code from Git. Um, and you know what? Maybe we're not doing there. I don't see a Maven build actually happening. We do this Maven Spring Boot. Maybe I missed that part. We can go back and add that real quick. Um, just for some some free content here. Let's see, your bonus content of the day is what it is, right? So let's see, build environment, here's a build execution. Um, started that, I've started that, so somewhere in here I need to do another build. Where is this? Add build step and do a top level Maven one and I'll just do install, add build step. Uh, well, no, that one's done and then I wanna move it up Let's see, we want to make sure that we build before we launch the product. We don't really care if it's before we kill the application or not. So I'm just going to leave it right there, apply, save, and then let's run this again. And this is your um, on-the-fly presentation, Steve, um, from, from just north of here. Let me see if this will work. Hopefully it works. Otherwise, you've got me in a mess of trouble, Steve. Let's see if it works here. Console output, ah, that looks a little better. Okay, so we finished. So here is where we're building now. This is where Maven started, our Maven install. It's going through copying one resource, compiling six source files into there. So there you go, Steve. 
hope that helps. What other questions are out there? Um, you're welcome to raise your hand and I will unmute you and you can ask live right here. If you have questions that you want to type, you can put them in the, the questions thing. Let's see. Um, here we go. Steve, you're welcome, Steve. <laughs> Steve says thanks. So, um, you know, while we're doing this, I've got some polls that I would like some information on. And the first quick poll I'm asking is, uh, do you automate your testing? I'd like to know that about your company, your team, um, or you, however you want to answer that. But if you'll just take a minute and answer that, it looks like a large percentage of you all do test automation of some sort. So I'm going to give it just a couple more six seconds here. We've got about 50% of those votes in, 60%. Now they're moving. I just have to tell them how many people have voted, and then they move quickly, right? Uh, so that's about two-thirds of folks have voted there. And the answer is 44% yes is what it looks like. Let me do another of these questions here. Does your team currently use continuous integration is the next one. So if you'd answer that, I want to see. This helps me kind of understand what the audience is like. It helps me understand what you're doing. It helps me kind of get a feel for what's going on in the industry, although I know this is a small data set and a small subset of the industry. But it helps me learn about you. And it's also kind of food for conversation later. One thing that I really like to do is to go back and have conversations later with people and learn more about what they're doing. And it also gives me a chance to see if there are ways that we at Beaufort Fairmont can help you out. Um, and of course, you know, that's a big reason why we're doing some of this is we want to figure out, is there a place where we fit in with your organization? Is there a place where we can help you with your test automation challenges? And if so, let's move forward on that together. We're always looking for new clients um, and we're always signing new clients. So that last question, does your team currently use test audit or currently use CI? I've closed it up now. We had about 70% of folks vote this time. And it looked like the winner was yes with test automation. Um, but the the answer, let's see, so no but not, let's see, yes but not with test automation running. So that was about 30%. And another 30% roughly was no but we want to. So that helps me out a lot. I've got one more poll question here. My biggest challenge with continuous integration is, so you should be viewing that right now, Go ahead and vote on that. I, I want to know what your biggest challenge is. And the options here are, um, you know, I don't know what I don't know. So in other words, I don't know enough to, to even get started with test automation. I don't know what my questions are. I don't know where to start. So I don't know what I don't know. Second is, I don't have the same skill set to work on it, or I don't have the skills to work on it. In other words, maybe your team doesn't have the skills with regard to continuous integration. Um, it's complicated. Uh, that, that can mean what you want it to mean, right? It's complicated. Our organization doesn't know what it wants or continuous integration is complicated. Um, I'm not allowed to work on it would be another option or for whatever reason your greater, your, your higher ups haven't, haven't um, given you the chance to work on it. So um, we've got roughly 60% of the vote in. I'm going to close this in just a second here. So go ahead and vote if you'd like. Once again, I'm just trying to understand as much as I can about you all and get a starting point for learning more together. And that's the last poll question that I have. I think that there is a survey after we get done here today. I want to make sure that you all feel comfortable getting in touch with me. That's why I've had my contact information all over here. You've got our number at Beaufort Fairmont here. It does look like a Durham number, but it's a virtual number. So if you don't get a hold of us at that, please leave a message and we'll get back to you. We're, we're very busy here, got a lot going on, trying to service as many different clients as possible at the same time. Um, join our webinars, you're here now, come back next time. You can sign up to be on our mailing list if you're on this. I will make sure to let you know about the next one. It will be in May sometime. I have not picked a date. I like the Monday one o'clock. I also like Wednesday one o'clock. So we'll see about that. You can email me here with questions. I'm gonna reach out to you if I haven't reached out to you before, hopefully. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to, to do this. But I like to reach out to the folks on these webinars and say, hey, let's spend an hour together. Let's take a, an hour. Set it aside, we'll get on the phone or Skype or Google Hangouts or whatever, and let's talk about what's going on with your test automation. And if there's anything that I can do to help you in that hour, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do everything I can to possibly to, to help you. And if I can't, um, you know, what were you gonna do anyway? Use your lunch hour, whatever, right? So <laughs> drink a cup of coffee. Uh, bring your team to that hour if you want, and we'll talk through what their questions are. But generally, I can give something of value in an hour to a team or to an individual from a team about their test automation. And if from there we realize that there's more work that we can do together, that's fine. And if not, that's fine too. 
Um, but take me up on that offer. Call me about it. Send me an email and say you want to spend that time together. That would be great. I look forward to getting to know each of you. Um, and I'm just checking over any last questions here. Yes, this. I, so Tom asked, is this going to be available for replay? I am recording right now. I'm hoping that the recording works. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, regardless of whether it works or not, at some point in the very near future, I will have a recording up. I try to get them up same day. Today, there's no, I, I don't see any way I'll be able to do that if I have to record this again. But um, I will do it as soon as possible. I'll record it and have it up. You should also have a link to it in the email that's sent out as a follow-up to this webinar um, as well. You can go to the webinars page on our website and find it later as well. Let's see a couple other questions here. How do you see Jenkins working with dev QA? Looks to me like dev enters code, test manager runs test automation, and then works with dev to show them what to fix. Yes. Um, so John always, John's always got good questions. Thank you, John. Um, so how do I see this working with Dev and QA? So the way that I typically see this working is very nicely. Um, what I typically see with test automation is number one, so, so there are a couple pieces to this. Number one, if your team isn't using continuous integration, let's figure out why and let's move ahead quickly. You just saw me set this up in an hour. Granted, I practiced, but remember, I only practiced for 35 hours, and a major part of that was figuring out how to demo it for you rather than how to get it to work. Okay, um, and I had some constraints that others didn't have. So what would be the reasoning for not having continuous integration set up right now? The benefits will pay you back in no time um, with running at least your applications in continuous integration. If we're talking about running test automation as well, uh, test automation, what, what, the way that I see this working is it's very nice. It's really terrific to have that feedback from these automated tests immediately when you check your code in. So you may have unit tests that run in a few minutes. You may have integration tests that people have written that will run in a matter of maybe eight or 10 minutes or whatever it is. You may have a suite of UI tests that takes hours and maybe that only runs once a night or three times a day or four times a day or whatever. But generally the process there is that you have someone who's responsible and knows they're responsible and is accountable for the test automation running and figuring out what the problems are with it. So if they come in the next morning after a big long run of UI tests, that individual comes in, they're checking out, figuring out what worked, what didn't. Did it work because the test cases were broken? Did it work because the automation had a problem? Did it work because the system was down? Did it work because we had fluctuations in networking uh, latency or something like that? What was the issue with this particular test case? And then they take those issues once they've decided it's not our problem with our test automation and they say, hey devs, this is what I found. Now, Another part of this is that there's nothing stopping a developer from going and looking at this. Remember, everything we had here was very transparent. You can see it on the web page for Jenkins. The reason we have it up there on Jenkins is so that everybody can see it. So if you see that a build broke, you're welcome to go out and check it. And there are a lot of other considerations here. Some folks in the industry like to talk about these um, considerations, things like if your builds are always broken, you know, you may have a problem. And there are ways to get around that. What I've given you is a very short hopefully sometimes entertaining description of how this can work. Um, but I do see it as a collaborative effort. I don't see it as, a, as one individual running automated tests. I see this as continuous, so they're running all the time. Um, and you're breaking up your test suites so that they work for your environment. We're running out of time here. I see a couple other questions here, so I'm going to try to get through them. Hi, we have CI and automated checks in. Oh, she said checks, so she's read her, uh, her work, and I know who this is anyway, Iona. Um, but so checks is a term that was is, is used by John Bach and Michael Bolton, who I had a chance to meet this past week. I met Michael, not John, um, and they they use it to differentiate between things that are done in rote and repeatedly. So checks are things that are done repeatedly. Testing is something that is more creative, and we actually have to think about. So anyway, hi, we have CI and automated checks in um, their application. The output are. NuGet packages that are deployed manually into a test environment. Can I use Jenkins or a similar solution to set up a set of tests to run against this test environment? Absolutely. Uh, I don't know enough about your environment from this one comment to tell you exactly how to do that. It sounds like if you're using NuGet packages, then you're in C Sharp right, and in the .NET world. Uh, we've done this with Jenkins in the .NET world. We've done it with other applications, uh, other CI applications as well. 
Um, but you know, when you're building that NuGet package, you can create test cases against that package. Just because it's a library doesn't mean that we can't test it. Just because it doesn't have a UI doesn't mean that we can't test it. We might need more technical skills or we not, might need to borrow some technical skills from dev in order to interact with that library. And they may have to put some kind of fixture on top of it. And then we might want to plug that into something that's human readable like Cucumber or Robot Framework or Gauge or something along those lines. But absolutely, we can create automated tests against a NuGet package or a library of some type. Um, you're talking about manually deploying to a test environment. That part's going to be a problem. If you're, I mean, of course, you could write test automation for that, but then it's going to be dependent on a manual process. We really want to have one button deploys where we can. And the, I say one button deploy, meaning that either a timer can run it or a person can press a button. And the reason we want to do that for deployment and for building of our code is so that it's done exactly the same way every time. It also forces us to understand the differences between environments and consider them uh, once and persist those differences once for each application or each environment. And by doing that, we get a much more consistently built product. We have a one place where we can go and look for problems in the deployment. Um, but that can be very difficult, I understand. But there are a lot of really great tools out there for what we call um, orchestration, which is what this activity is. Things like Puppet, things like um, Chef, and lots of other great tools. Looks like there are no other, no other questions here. You guys are dropping like flies because it's 2 o'clock. Thank you so much for being here. Once again, yes, I will try to have a recording out there as soon as possible. Hopefully this is being recorded and it will be available very quickly. Thank you so much. Once again, please take me up on that hour of talking together. Let's find some time, usually best for me Monday through Thursday, and find an hour, chat with you or your team, figure out what's going on, what I can do to help. If there's any challenges or whatever, I'm more than happy to lend you an ear and hopefully a lot more. Thank you so much for your time and y'all have a great day. Thanks.